Got a few more people coming in. Welcome. It's just about 2.30 on the second Wednesday of the month, which means it is Read, Watch, Listen. One of our favorite days of the month here in the Palm Beach County Library System. Read, Watch, Listen is an hour long recommendation hour stuff sourced by staff sharing their favorite books, films, TV shows, music, all available with your library card through various services or physical copies located at our branches. Speaking of these various services, uh, as you're watching today, you probably will hear a few services you may not be familiar with. Uh, we've got Hoopla, we've got Cloud Library, we've got Freegal, um, things like that. If you are familiar with it, great, glad you're using them. Um, they're awesome, nice way to carry your things around with you if you're traveling or just don't feel like lugging around a big bag of books or movies. Uh, if you aren't familiar with them, you can come by any of our locations and we'd be happy to walk you through how to get these things onto your devices anytime. Uh, also, as usual, I am joined by some awesome colleagues from around the system. Um, let me introduce everyone. We have a few people from our West Boca branch representing hard. We've got JP Chua, we've got Joss Holford, and we have Kimberly Raken. And I think maybe a first from our uh, marketing department here, we have Caitlin Morrissey. So she's really behind the scenes. She'd be hard to find if you go searching for her in a branch, but she does a lot of really important work uh, getting things up, promoting our programming and social media, things like that. And of course we have Brianna Vasquez from our Green Acres branch. Thank you all for being here today. We would not be able to do this without you. And last and definitely not least, my co-host, Michelle Perales is on the call with us today. So with all that said, let's get that started with the read round. And we will get started with JP's pick. Hi, JP, how good are you? everyone. Good, good. How are you today? I'm very fine, thanks. So we're gonna start, good, good. So we're gonna start with uh, my pick for today, which is IQ84 by Haruki Murakami. So you can find it through um, physical copy at our branch, through our Hoopla and Cloud Library, if you prefer the e-devices. Um, so I chose IQ84 because of uh, the storyline. It's kind of like 1984 by, you know, uh, George Orwell. Um, the reason why it's called IQ84, because in Japanese, uh, number nine is pronounced as Q, so they kind of just did a play with it. So it's separated in three parts. So the first part is from the first three months, which is April, May, and June, and then the second part is July, August, September, and the third part of the series is October, November, and December. So it's about this girl, which is Aomame. She's an assassin. She's hired by a group who, who does not like certain groups. So, and it moves from one reality to another. So, I may have lost JP. I'm not sure if everyone else can hear him. We lost you there for a second, JP. Um, you're in the middle of explaining the plot a little bit too. So I'm not sure if everyone okay, lost so you. I'll go a little bit more. So it's about Aomame. So she's an assassin. She comes from a different reality. She moves from one different reality to another. And then you have Tango as well, who is a literary agent and he's in the present, but he doesn't know which reality he's in. So it jumps back and forth. It's a little bit confusing. It took me a while to actually reread and re-listen to the book, finally understood it. And the reason they compare it to 1984 because you have the utopia, the cults, which controls everything. So people... ...mob and destroy this cult to stop, you know, being free. So it's more like 1984, the government and you know, Big Brother watching you, so it's the same concept. So if you like the uh, scientific science 
reality, um, jumping back and forth like the timeline. This would be a good book. It's just, it's a very book, book, big book. It's like 983 pages all in all. And when it released in Japan in 2009, they actually split it into three parts. So the first part, it's like 300 pages, second part, 300 pages, and the fourth, the third book was like another 300 plus pages. But when they move it here in the US, they put them all in one book. So that's my choice. Yeah. Uh, if you haven't read of Murakami's book, he's an interesting author. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, I think uh, I'm glad you mentioned the length because I think it came up when we were preparing last week. It's one of his books that I've been personally intimidated to jump into. Uh, but to to Murakami's credit, you know, uh, that book, I think, has sold millions of copies, too. So to be able to sell almost a thousand page book, millions of copies of it, it says a lot for the work. And if anyone out there is looking for an ambitious weekend read, go grab this from the library, right, JP? Yes, and then the, I want to add that this book actually. Ah. Yeah, we might, we might be having some connection issues down there, JP. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, it's uh, actually chosen as the best book literary from 1980s to 2019 in Japan, this book. Very cool. Good to know. Yeah, Murakami is really good for anyone on the call that's having a hard time uh, hearing what JP is saying. I, I, sorry about the technical difficulties, but uh, if, if you're unfamiliar with his work, uh, what are some of his uh, Kafka on the Shore, Wind Up Bird Chronicles? Those are uh, in Norwegian wood, I think, are some of the more easier ways to get into his catalog if you haven't read anything yet. But he's a legendary author, a very polarizing too, though. But I, I think anyone worth reading might be a little polarizing. All right, we'll move on to the next one. We have Caitlin Morrissey with California Dreamin', which is a graphic novel published in 2015 that covers the life of the woman who became to be Cass Elliot and uh, singer from the Mamas and the Papas. Uh, tell us about this, Caitlin. Uh, what, what, what made you want to share this with us today? It looks like an interesting book. Yeah, I love this book. It's probably one of my favorite graphic novels I've ever read. I'm not really into graphic novels typically. Um, I actually found it on accident. I was in the stacks and it's in the bio section because it's about Cass Elliot. And um, I've, I read The Spine California Dream. I was like, I love that song. I love the moms and the papas. I wonder if I was anything to do with it. And I flipped it open and I was like, oh, it's a graphic novel. I'm definitely going to read this. Um, so definitely um, highly recommend it follows the life of Cass Elliot um, before she was in the Mamas and the Papas. So as a child, it, fall, it starts there. And then it ends where they create their first single, uh, California Dreamin'. Um, and the, the style of the graphic novel is really easy read. It's super like loose. It's super sketchy. Um, and that's really what I liked about it. I really like the style. Um, it really captures how sassy and strong Cass Elliot is. If you don't know who she is, also known as Mama Cass, if that's familiar. Um, yeah, and I just, I love her personality and any interview I've like watched of hers have, has been amazing. So it really captures who I think she is or was. Um, so yeah, I highly recommend. Awesome. I'm a fan of uh, the Mamas and Papas. Fortunately, I would say I'm only really familiar with some of their bigger hits. Though. I don't think I've really spend too much time with an album but I, i'm sure that's an awesome story and i will second i'm sure everyone on the call will too that the beautiful moments of walking through the stacks and just letting something catch your eye yes. so <laughs> i, I kind of miss that a little bit uh staying inside mostly nowadays but when things get back to normal i think uh browsing is 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 i'm due for a good browse to the stacks <laughs> so thanks for sharing that one uh on to brianna vasquez from our green acres branch She's here to talk about Angie Thomas's latest, Concrete Rose. Uh, if you're not familiar with Angie Thomas, she released a book that was very successful in the recent past called The Hate You Give that was made into a motion picture that was also successful. Uh, I believe Concrete Rose is set in the same uh, neighborhood as The Hate yeah. You Give uh, a few years mm -hmm. earlier. You want yeah, to tell us about it? Um this is actually like a, um, a prequel to The Hate You Give. Mm -hmm. So it follows, um, I think Maeve, Big Maeve, um, he's the father of the, the girl who was 
the main character of The Hate You Give. So it follows him when he's about 17 years old and he finds out that, um, that he got someone pregnant and it's someone that he's not even in a relationship with. So him trying to like figure out how to be a teen father and uh, what it means to like really be a man and stuff like that. And like um, just him figuring it out because he was, um, his father is um, uh, in prison because he got caught up with like a lot of gang violence and stuff like that. And because he's like the son um, he's expected to join the same gangs and follow in his footsteps. But now that he has a kid on the way, he doesn't really want to have that future for his um, own life or for his um, his son. So I just like, it was really sweet. And it was, it was a really quick read and I love it so much. <laughs> um, I don't normally, cause I work at a library, so I don't buy books anymore. Cause it's easy for me to just like read them and return them, but this is something I'm definitely going to buy for myself because I can see myself rereading it again and again. It's just, like really well written. Angie Thomas is such a great writer. <laughs> yeah, I can't really to read this one. I really did enjoy The Hate You Give and um, looking forward to this one too. Uh, do you know if they're going to be doing a film for this one as well? or has um, that been... I'm not sure about this one. I know her second book, On the Come Up, is currently being made mm -hmm. into a movie. So I think they're just focusing on that one, but I don't see why they wouldn't, like maybe when they're done with that one, look into okay. this because it's a really good book. Yeah, yeah. We'll keep our ears open for any any film news. Yeah. And thanks for sharing that, Brianna. It brings us to Josh Wolford with Darius the Great is Not Okay, debut novel by a deep Corum, award winner. Tell us about this, Josh. I love the cover. Hello. Um, so Darius the Great is not okay. Is obviously about Darius, who um, his grandfather is. He's dying of a brain tumor, and so him and his family decide that they need to go to his mother's home country and it deals a lot with intersectionality and what it's like to be too american for one country but not american enough for being in america and just like how he always feels different and darius deals with depression in his life and anxiety so it also talks a lot about mental health rep and how um, and he's always being asked why he just can't be happy. So it, it, it deals a lot with like so many societal issues, mental disorders, depression. It, it does a really good job of focusing on those, but not making it all about those issues. That's probably one of the better ways to kind of weave those important issues into the narrative, right? Uh, it's not, mm -hmm. It sounds like a book that I definitely need to get around to reading if I can one of these days. And like I said, I really do uh, like the, the cover of it is very, very captivating, the color, so. Yeah, so the first book's been out for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I didn't actually start reading it until I realized that it came out with a second book. Okay. So the second book is called Darius the Great Deserves Better. And so like I read them back to back and it was it was amazing. Very cool. Well, if you have time to read it, that's a good recommendation there from Josh. Thanks, Josh. Brings us to Kimberly at our West Boca project uh, branch, branch as well with the Thank You Projects, published in 2019. I did see that the author also has a podcast that sounds pretty interesting, Kimberly Midlife Mixtape. I don't know if you've come across that. Uh, it seems pretty cool where they she interviews a lot of folks in their midlife and kind of how they're dealing with that mentally and physically. Anyways, that was just a cool thing I picked up on. Tell us about, uh, about why you decided to share this with us today. So Nancy, the author, she was embracing like 
her milestone birthday. So she decided to take on her own thank you project to write letters to people who impacted her life. So basically the book just gives you like the tips and tools that she learned along the way and like just giving you ideas of like who you could write to. So it's like, it could be your friends, your family, your cousins, like your doctor, or like even the person at the grocery store who was like nice to you. And then she said that with each letter, you should print it out and bind it into a book. So on those days that you need like a little pick me up, you can go back into your thank you project letters and reread them. Very cool. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Um, sounds like maybe we should try to do it as a library program or something. Maybe we'll talk more about that, but I'm uh, definitely into to the concept around this and more and more that I read about uh, the power of offering thanks and gratitude, the, the benefits for yourself too, you know, the three things you're grateful for every day type thing. So I, especially in times like that we're all dealing with the world right now, I think this is a good thing for everyone to kind of keep their focus on remembering to be grateful for what we have and stuff. So thanks for sharing. Uh, this is available in, uh, at our branches. And that'll bring us to the second round, the watch. These will be uh, movies, TV shows, again, all available through our library system. And the, so the first one, I'm so glad that we're getting to talk about a film from this era of Hollywood with JP, Roman Holiday. The 1953 classic starring little known actors Gregory Peck and Audrey Hepburn. Uh, it's a romance film, JP. I've, I've pegged you as a, a romantic just from some conversations we've had over the last few months. We're in the same boat. Uh, and this is probably one of the, 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 best, the best versions of romance, the, the highly unrealistic ones. Those are my favorite ones. <laughs> now tell us more about why you picked this though, JP. It's an awesome, awesome movie. Okay, so Roman Holiday, um, it's a classic. It's by William Wyler. He's a very prominent director in, back in the old days of Hollywood. I mean, he's done a lot of films. Um, I chose Roman Holiday because I'm a big fan of uh, Gregory Peck, of course. Um, I've seen most of his films. Uh, the first film that I've seen him was probably To Kill a Mockingbird, which is one of his famous ones, but this is um, previous to that. And who, we can't go wrong with Audrey Hepburn. I mean, it's her first big Hollywood film. This is literally put, what put her in the map. Um, she's done some other films prior to this, but they're very, you know, small parts, bit parts. And so Roman Holiday, it's about a guy, which is uh, Gregory Peck. He plays Joe. He's a reporter. He was sent by his boss to get a scoop and dirt about this princess from a you know fictional European country which is played by Audrey Hepburn uh, she's Princess Anne and it's set in Italy in Rome and he wants he goes there to get the scoop but unbeknownst to him she escapes from her duties and pretends to be a commoner and of all the places that she drops into his lap and they started going out, they became friends, they start falling in love, and turns out he finds out that she was the princess that he was get, about to get the scoop for, but he felt bad and decided not to write the letter or to write the report or news about her. Um, so that's pretty much the gist of the film. It's a classic film. It's it's great for everything, you know, it's like for young and old. Um, the funny thing about this is that Gregory Peck didn't want to do the movie because they didn't want to give Audrey Hepburn the starring role because it's her first film. So they're like, oh, just do an introduction, in, like, you know, like a, you have to have the first billing. And Gregory Peck's like, I'm not doing it until she gets first billing. And he was right because he was telling the company that did it. You know, Paramount was like, no, we're not going to do it. She's an unknown. He's like, no, we have to do it. And she won the Academy Award for it. And Gregory Peck was right. He's like, she's going to be a big star. That's a cool story. And he was right. <laughs> Very cool. Well, if, if anyone hasn't seen this film, I, I second JP's recommendation. And you can grab a copy at our branches. Thanks, JP.
On to another great movie that I will second the recommendation as well. This is A Life Aquatic with Steve Zissou. Uh, awesome soundtrack. Very, very hilarious, surreal, touching story. And uh, I'll let Caitlin tell more about why she decided to share this with us today. Hey, Caitlin. Hi. Um, I chose this because it's probably one of the funniest movies I've ever seen, but very subtly. It's It might be marketed as a comedy, but it's so subtle and it's one-liners and it's so witty that it's something I put on really to, like to cheer myself up. Uh, so it follows Steve, I believe it's Zisu, but I always say Zizu. I don't know how to pronounce it. <laughs> Um, but it follows him and his crew trying to find this rare jaguar shark that um, killed one of his previous crew members. So he's kind of getting revenge on this really weird shark. And um, there's a film crew that's documenting this whole process. So that is kind of the big storyline of the movie. Um, but they come across pirates. Um, his ex-wife is on the boat. Um, there's someone on the boat that thinks that um, Steve's zoo is his father so there's always these really weird kind of um, moments happening within the film that are really funny and there's also someone that's pregnant on the on the submarine so it's just really quirky um, like he was saying like the music is amazing if you like David Bowie I believe the artist is Brazilian but he um, he does renditions of David Bowie songs in Portuguese that are amazing they're acoustic and it's probably one of my favorite parts of it. Um, it was directed by Wes Anderson. So if you've seen Royal Tenenbaums or uh, Grand Budapest Hotel or Moonrise Kingdom and you kind of liked uh, the colors he uses or any, any of his shots he is like famous for, um, I would highly recommend this. Yes, definitely. If, uh, any other film by Wes Anderson, if you've seen it and you haven't seen this one, you should... Uh... Yes, you, would, you would love it. I mean, he's definitely got like a, a style. So that would be something like Royal Tenenbaums or if you go back to his early work, Bottle Rocket even. Um, he's got a lot. <laughs> this this movie is great. Um, I can't recommend it enough. I think I let everyone that's on the call today know I, I, I dated myself. I saw this in a movie theater that is no longer open. So just do the math. Anyways, <laughs> it's, a, it's an awesome film. Um, Moving on. Thank you, Caitlin. We will be talking about New Girl here with Brianna Vasquez. This is a TV show uh, that ran for a while, I believe, on Fox. Is that correct? Uh, starring Zoe Deschanel. This is Michelle's second favorite show of all time. And uh, yeah, I'd love to hear more from Brianna about why she decided to share with us today. Um, this is a... Uh... I started watching this show recently because of the fact that they took Parks and Rec off of Netflix. So I just started binging this one. Um, I actually finished it, but it's like my new show that I play in the background whenever I just need something to distract me. But I just really like it. Um, it's really fun. Um, a lot of the characters are just like, they have big personalities, but they all work well together. And it's like such, I love shows with like a tight knit group of people who are just like all friends with each other. So um, I really like this show. Um, if you don't know anything about it, I guess um, one thing you can say, it's like a reverse threes company where um, um, the main character Jess moves into a loft with three guys and um, it starts out they don't know each other at all but then as the seasons go by they all become like the best of friends and it's a really great show awesome thanks <laughs> i've seen it before but not enough to talk about it too much other than like, it is really funny i yeah, know that. it's really silly just Sometimes, like over the top <laughs> yeah like people send me clips uh, of of the funny parts, so yeah. that's kind of my my exposure to it. If, if anyone's looking for a funny show, this this definitely has that like modern kind of surreal, almost random humor. Yeah, it's just a really goofy, ecosystem. funny show. Yeah, yeah, it's good. That's very good. <laughs> well, thank you, Brianna. On to my friend Joshua Holford, weathering with you, 2019 animated film. This is. 
somewhat of a what, epic fantasy romance. So we, we're sticking with some romance here. Uh, tell us about this, Josh. What's this all about? So Weathering With You is made by the same person who made my last watch rec recommendation, um, Your Name. And the animation, the art, everything is just so absolutely, absolutely beautiful. It's breathtakingly stunning. Um, the premise in this is our main character, the boy in the left-hand corner. He ran away from his home and moved to Tokyo, Tokyo when he was 16. And at the beginning, he's just very, he's kind of homeless for a little while until he finds a guy who ends up helping him and he ends up working for him for a little while. And while he's working for him, he meets our second main character, the girl right here, who turns out to be a, what's called a sunshine girl. And basically she can bring the sunshine to rainy, rainy Tokyo. And Tokyo is going through a unprecedented um, rainy season. So many bad storms, weather and stuff during this time. And it turns out the only way to save Tokyo from flooding and having this bad weather forever is by sacrificing herself. Tech, uh, that's what the myths and everything says. So it's all about their relationship, what it means to be a sunshine girl, what it means to be a homeless child in Tokyo, um, the relationship they build and basically just what the world means to them and what makes Tokyo special, what makes their place in Tokyo special and the relationships that they build. All right. It sounds like something definitely worth watching. If anyone on, on the call is looking for something that I think I'm going to try to get around to this too. I'm still need to get to the last one you recommended first. So is it should probably be watching that order, right? No, doesn't matter. Michelle shaking her head. Okay. Well, on to the next one. Last one for this round is Last Man Standing, starring not Tim the Toolman Taylor, but Tim Allen, who used to be Tim the Toolman Taylor. I'm sorry, did I didn't hear the last part you said. It's okay. It's all right. Um, so, uh, Tim Allen has a new show that has been on the air, not so new anymore, but I still know him as Tim the Toolman Taylor, but I want to learn more about Last Man Standing. I can't wait to hear from Kimberly about why she took this today. Hello, Kimberly? They were having some lagging issues earlier, so I'm not sure if we're dealing with that right now. Is, is she, can anyone hear Kimberly at all right now? Or is it just, is she, can anyone let me know? No, she's muted. Okay. All right, well, in the meantime. Oh, I think we lost them, I think. They disconnected. Oh, there they are. Here she comes. All right. Possibly problem solved. The internet's weird sometimes, people. Yeah. We're all trying our best. Thanks, Kimberly. You're, you're freezing, so. Um, so I picked this show because it kind of reminds me of Home Improvement, which he was in, but instead of him having three sons, now he has three daughters. And instead of him being like Tim the Tool Man, now he works at like a shop called Outdoor Man. And it's essentially him trying to like navigate his life, like living with like three women who are like very dramatic. And at like Outdoor Man, he has like a vlog, but instead of like advertising his like Outdoor Man equipment, he uses it for his like, I don't wanna say like political beliefs, but he kind of like says things about like the environment and like he makes like passes at like the political state of like the world and stuff like that. 
So yeah, yeah. I like it. <laughs> it's an Sounds easy watch and like a good laugh. If that's what you're interested in. Yeah, it sounds funny. Like uh like a so like self-aware almost meta kind of humor. Uh I, I do have a serious question though about it. Does he is there any sort of uh new version of the uh? <laughs> uh, no? Okay. No. <laughs> that was my joke. Anyways, uh Tim Allen is pretty funny. If you guys aren't familiar with the show, I haven't watched this one, but I, I'm sure if, I mean, sitcoms don't really get much better than Home Improvement was. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited to kind of check out where he's at at this point in his career for sure. Thank you, Kimberly. And that rounds out the watch round. I think they're all gonna link up on that one, yeah. You guys are all gonna share that one computer now, it looks like. Okay, cool. So. On the listen round, final round of the day. Uh, before we get started, I just wanna let you know I will be sharing something in the chat if you have the time. Uh, it's an evaluation form for today. Uh, we really appreciate hearing kind of how we're doing. If you can take a second, there will be a link coming in the chat very soon. And we also will be sharing a list of everything that was reviewed today. And if you did pre-register for today, you can expect an email from me afterward as well with all the stuff if you don't grab it from the chat. Okie dokie. Starting with the listen round. Let's do this. We're gonna go back to JP. What do we got? There we go. Jersey Boys, motion picture and Broadway musical soundtrack. Tell us about this, JP. Hey, Jersey Boys. So, growing up, I was big into the Broadway show because my dad was big into it. And then as I was getting into my teens, I was getting to 1960s music, 70s music, 80s music, and things like that. So when I saw the show and I'm like, hmm, Jersey Boys, I'm like, what's this show about? And then I find out it was Frankie, but it's about Frankie Valley and the Four Seasons. So I was like, that might be an interesting show to watch. So I never see it on Broadway in New York, but when they were here in Broadway Performing Arts, I was able, had a chance to actually see the show. So it's actually about the life of Frankie Valley and Four Seasons, how they start, you know, a, they put the songs into the show, their big hits, and then they make it to fit into the show about their lives. So you have Sherry, Ragdoll, um, Big Girls Don't Cry, uh, you have Oh What a Night, you have My Eyes Adored You. So all of their big hits were in that show. And then when the movie came out in 2014, it was directed by Clint Eastwood. It won a lot of Tony Awards. Unfortunately, the movie didn't really win a lot of awards, but it was still a great film. I still watch it up to now. It's like, so if you like 1960s music, if you like Frankie Valley, if you like Broadway show, take a look at it, check it out, listen to the music. It's, a, it's an amazing show. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, that's so many great things combined into one feel like there's something in there for everybody and what's really cool is it's available on hoopla for anyone that's never gotten music from hoopla rather than freegal which lets you have one song at a time hoopla's really nice because for the duration of your borrowing period you have the entire album which i find very uh pleasant i'm i'm kind of like a entire album kind of guy not about the singles anyways uh thank you jp on to Caitlin with album by a little known band, Radiohead, OK Computer here. Uh, this was their third album released in 1997. I believe it kind of catapulted them into masters of the art rock from the alternative world. And I must say, I do appreciate the Hitchhiker's Guide reference in the album title. So <laughs> tell us why you picked it today, Caitlin. So Radiohead has always been one of those bands that um, I really didn't delve deep into. Um, my older brothers were huge Radiohead fans and I knew Creep and Karma Police and a few of their singles. Um, but my brother had always recommended to listen to them. So I started listening to them and um, he recommended this album particularly. And um, like you said, it came out in 1997. Um, but now, re uh, 
listening to it in 2021, it, it, it was kind of odd because you feel like it's so contemporary, but it came from 1997 where I was even born. And I don't know, it really says something about like the 21st century life and um, consumerism and they're very anti-corporation and like you said, alternative, and they're definitely art rock. And while there's a lot of songs that are really weird, I feel like every person will they'll like at least one song on the album, but they'll truly, I don't know, really, like I understood listening to it, kind of their intention and it really, like I resonated with it. Um, like on the cover, which I think was really interesting, like the artwork, it's of a highway and it has something, they're saying something about like commuting and kind of like everyday life and how it's, I don't know, I just found that really interesting, and there's an airplane on it, and there's so much symbolism in the album, it's almost like a puzzle listening to it, but when you get it, you really get it, so it's really satisfying to listen to, and um, they were largely inspired by Miles Davis and the Beach Boys, and while they're not making jazz music, you can really listen and hear kind of those inspirations come through, so yeah, so if you like Beach Boys or Miles Davis, definitely listen to this. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, yeah, very uh, very influential and I would say ahead of its time album. Uh, yeah. Very, very good. Thank you, Caitlin. On to Brianna here with the soundtrack accompanying uh, a motion picture released by Lin-Manuel Miranda called In the Heights. Uh, you'll probably recognize that name from his work on the Hamilton project that you really have to not be paying attention to much to not be knowing what that is. Uh, I, speaking of not paying attention much, I'm probably the only person on the call that hasn't seen this film yet. But uh, I'd love to hear from Brianna more about why she chose the soundtrack for the listen round today. Um, okay, so I'm actually really a big fan of Broadway music. So um, I've been waiting for this movie since like they announced it. I think they announced it around 2016 that it was gonna be, in, it was in development. So I'm really excited. Um, the original Broadway um, album, I think came out in 2008. Um, and he wrote this when he was in college. He was about 19 years old when he wrote um, In the Heights. So it's been like a long journey for this one. And it's really cool just to see it on the big screen. Um, and I really like it. Um, it follows um, a Dominican um, man named Luz Navi, whose parents uh, came to America to, you know, get like the whole American dream. And um, they died fairly young, but they left him a store. So he runs a store in Washington Heights and it just follows him and everyone like it's that like sense of identity of like um, he's trying to figure out if he wants to go back to the Dominican Republic or stay in America because he doesn't know where like home is so that's like the journey is just following him and trying to figure out like um, where his home is it's really nice awesome very cool. I'm sure the music is wonderfully composed, too. Yeah, uh, the music's I, great. <laughs> I do know a few of the tunes off his other well-known work. Uh, thank you for sharing this. And it, it's available on Hoopla again. Another one of those options to get the whole thing at once, which is really nice. On to the next one in this round. Back to Josh. Black Witch by Lori Forrest. This is the first in a series of, I believe, six books, right? The Black Witch it's gonna, Chronicles. It's going to be six books. She's making. She's writing the fifth one now. The fourth one gets released in September. All right. Cool. Well, tell uh, us all about well before I do that, I just want to say I'm a huge fan of In the Heights too. Like right. so much. It's the only ticket stub I still have in my wallet. Oh, cool. So from when I watched it um, in on Sunrise Civic Theater, it was great, um, and the movie was amazing. But anyway, I love music, but I, I, whenever it comes to read, watch, listen, I always pick an audiobook because I listen to those more. I listen to those whenever I get the chance. Um, so The Black Witch by Laurie Forrest is an amazing fantasy uh, YA young adult series. Um, and 
so in this world, basically, there's a lot of um, the best way to say it is basically there's a lot of racism. There's a lot of literally racism because it's different races, like actual like elves and like different humanoid races and those like demi humans and a bunch of other things. Um, and there's a lot of superiority issues. There's a lot of, um, there's, it, it deals with a, a bunch of different sociological issues. And the main character at the beginning of the book, she was very, very sheltered. Um, and she didn't know much about the world. But she's always been kind of taught these things as part of her people's history that like other races are bad and all this stuff. And it is a journey of this main character being thrown into a world where it's not quite what she thought it was, where she learns how the real world actually is. She learns that her people are actually kind of messed up. Like what she's been taught is wrong and how like other races races aren't evil and like homosexuality isn't evil. Like her, one of the main characters in the series is gay and she was always told that this is wrong. And it's just, the very first book sets the ground for like her development. So like her growth as a person, learning all this stuff is wrong and by the end of it, basically, she realizes that she needs to help find a way to fight back against everything that's going on in her society. So, and use all that, the sociological issues, um, but then throw in like magic and a giant like war that could devastate the world. And this is what this book is. <laughs> Very cool. Sounds sounds heavy, but again, like the recommendation that you did in the first round, the Darius, you know, kind of weaving these very serious issues into a good story, which yeah. is very helpful in maybe understanding these things a little bit more. So hopefully we're all reading a little bit about this kind of stuff. I always find I always seem to find a way to find sociological issues in books. So <laughs> it's just the thing. Very nice. Well, thanks, Josh. Thank you. Brings us to the end here. Back to Kimberly. This is uh, the latest, and I believe it, probably the final book in Miss Peregrine's Peculiar Children series, right? By Ransom Riggs. Uh, it just came out this year. So I know it was like an instant bestseller. Um, my former roommate was watching the TV show. I believe it, I caught a couple of episodes. I definitely like the, the visual aspect. Uh, tell us about the book though, Kimberly. Why'd you uh, pick it today? Peregrine's Peculiar Children kind of reminds me of Harry Potter, but instead of like witches and wizards, it's more of like children that have peculiar abilities. So like some of them have, can like float, like one can like create fire with their hands and like, like there's one that like can like predict the future in their dreams. So like in this book, like Miss Peregrine's brother like comes back and like he's stronger than before and he's trying to like take over like all the loops that like the peculiar children live in so that they can like stay alive and he's like like where Miss Peregrine's family is like he's making it like rain ash and like do all these like weird things that they call like the desolations and what I like about the audiobook is that the person who reads it like has a different voice for like every single character. So it really like draws you in. But with like this book, it like forces the main character like to go back in time and like find the answers to like how to defeat Miss Peregrine's brother. So it's really good and I really like it. Like it's a good ending to the series. Awesome. Very cool. Uh, yeah, I, I feel like there's something special about uh, the way this is being told. I, I feel like we share a, 
uh, interest in sort of inverting a, a more popular model of retelling these stories. So um, there's a certain eerie darkness to it that I would uh, that I get from even my kind of little bit of exposure to it that that I don't get quite from some of the other uh, things that you mentioned there. So thank you. Uh, that that brings us to the end for today. Some awesome things that keep us busy until next month: reading, watching, listening things. Uh, I want to thank everyone from the library that's on the call. Again, we wouldn't really be able to do this with you without you guys month in and month out. So keep up the good work. Everyone on the call watching, let us know if you go out and find any of these things. We love hearing from you. Um, I'm going to drop that link to the evaluation forms right now. But uh, again, I would really love to hear if you're going out to our branches and doing it, trying out any of these things that people are recommending. It's always good to hear from you guys. So uh, until next month, which will be back September 8th. It'll actually be a Hispanic Heritage Month edition of Read, Watch, Listen. Uh, we'll see you then. If you have any questions in the meantime, just get in touch with us. Everyone have a great day.